This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 493, recorded on May 8th, 2018. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today here in New York City, Dixon de Pommier. Hello there, Vincent. Uh, what does it look like out it's the gorgeous. window? It's gorgeous outside. It's a perfect day. This is one of the best days of the year so far. Maybe the best day of the year. Light breeze, 70s, puffy white clouds. Hendrickson's are hatching up in the beaver kill. I'll be up there tomorrow to see if that's true. Those Henderson's. are Hendrickson. What's that? They're a mayfly. And this is the season for them. And I will be there to try my skills at trying to seduce trout off the original and into the artificial. My car is covered with pollen. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Spring yeah. is here. All That's the right. That's daffodils right. are out. You are right. And allergies are kicking up all over the place. Also joining us from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. It's Hello. really nice weather here, too. It's mm. 69 Fahrenheit or 73 on a different app, which is around 21 Celsius or probably 22. Right. <laughs> it's blue sky, no clouds. That's it. Weather makes you feel better, doesn't it? It does. Right. Yeah. And then getting through the winter is a real slog, isn't it? Well, it's, and it's, me. isn't it called SAD? Yeah. <laughs> so yesterday, <laughs> we had the final in my, my class, yep. and one young lady brings a little light box that she puts next to her and shines the light on her while she takes the exam because she says it makes her feel better. I'll be darned. She, hmm. she had come and asked me if she could do this. I said, sure. Nope, just sit in the back so you don't bother anyone. And she sat, I can see the glowing light up in the back of the room. Hmm. Also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. How you doing? All right. <clears throat> We've got uh, about 85 degrees, which is about 30 Celsius, few... High wispy clouds, otherwise uh, blue skies. It's a beautiful day, as has been for quite a while. Mm. It's great. Mm. And from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. And it is a very, very large, beautiful weather system. So it pretty much covers the whole half of the country, at least. It's gorgeous wow. here. 74 Fahrenheit, 23C. Just lovely. Yeah. I wonder if we've ever had an all gorgeous podcast. I don't know. <laughs> That's a good all title. All is clear though. on the Eastern Front. <laughs> it's, every week is all gorgeous. It is. We're all gorgeous. You know, come on. That's exactly yeah, we are recording on a funny day. Ha ha. Tuesday. Hilarious. You know what today is, though, really? Today is National Teacher's Day. Okay. Every day is something, right? This is National Teacher's Day. They're celebrating teachers and, and um Jeopardy has the teachers tournament this week as a result cool. of that. And it's very great uh, fun for them because there's a lot of science questions, by the way, that uh, mm -hmm. some of them actually get. <laughs> Anyways, if you, if you find our shtick is a little off, it's because it's Tuesday. Yeah, we're, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Feng Shui's messed up. Right? Exactly right. <laughs> right. We, haven't, we haven't had a rehearsal in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> ASM has a special opportunity for our podcast listeners get $50 off registration for Microbe 2018 June 7 to 11 in Atlanta using promo code ASMPOD ASM Microbe 2018 connects scientists with their science and showcases the best microbial sciences in the world I always wanted to do that Delve into your scientific niche in eight different tracks. <laughs> Don't miss this opportunity. Visit asm.org slash microbe. That's asm.org slash microbe and use promo code ASMPOD for $50 off registration. See you in Lanta. How about ASV, Kathy Spindler? Well, I want to remind you that ASV 2018 at the University of Maryland is July 14th to 18th. And what that means is that we're coming right up to the end of early bird registration. It ends May 19th at midnight on Saturday, May 19th. So all the registration rates go up after that. Get your registration done. And then we also have information that the housing is going fast. Uh, a couple of the hotels that are close to campus uh, have sold out their room blocks. Uh, there's still housing on campus. There's still housing in a couple of hotels. And then hotels where we didn't block rooms. 
uh, still have places available. So uh, don't delay. This is going to be a big one. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, I need to register. Go ahead, register. Yeah, you do. I'll do it right <laughs> after the show. Remind me. Okay. The microbiology department at the Icon School of Medicine is seeking faculty candidates interested in strengthening their program in virus host interactions. Applicants must hold a PhD and or MD, have postdoctoral experience, and be interested in creating a virus related research group that will complement the pre existing <clears throat> departmental programs. Recruitment of individuals or couples at the level of assistant, associate, or full professor will be considered. More information can be found at icon.mssm.edu. Should you wish to apply, send your CV and a brief description of your research plan to near nycvirology at gmail.com or contact Ben Tenover directly. Held every three years, the International Double-Stranded RNA Symposium is the premier conference for virologists interested in the biology of these viruses. The 28th the 2018 symposium will be held in Houfalis in the beautiful Ardennes region of Belgium. Wow. The conference venue is close to Brussels, which provides easy access for European and international travelers. The symposium offers scientists from around the world the opportunity to meet and hear the most up-to-date advances on a broad area of topics in double-stranded RNA virology. The organizing committee has selected a international group of dynamic speakers to present plenary talks on topics including virus structure, diversity of double-stranded RNA viruses, evolution and epidemiology using and abusing host pathways. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> I like that. That's good. <laughs> Immunity and pathogenesis, molecular and cellular virology, and applied double-stranded RNA virology. Students, postdocs, and scientists in the field of double-stranded RNA virology are encouraged to present their recent findings at the symposium. This year's program will also include a recording of TWIV with a special guest. Mm -hmm. Early bird registration ends May 31st. And we will put a link to that in the show notes because it's a bit too long to tell you right now. There we go. That's it for our service announcements. Is that what they yep. call them? Public, Public service, service announcements. Public service announcements. That's right. Public service announcements. Exactly. Now for a snippet, Rich Condit is going to tell us all about drugs. Yeah, <laughs> drugs. <laughs> He's got and the voice. Is, He's got the voice, doesn't he? So you, you tuned in and turned on, didn't you? That's Dude. Right. That's right. Dude. Dude. That's right. <laughs> okay. So I had what I would regard as almost a privilege of attending, uh, I guess it was last week, uh, an uh, FDA meeting. It was a meeting of the Anti-Infective Drugs Advisory Committee that I was invited to attend because they were considering approval of a drug that we have talked about before, which is an anti-pox viral agent uh, that for a long time, uh, we, we've always called it ST246, which was its name for a long time, uh, but is now officially Tecovirumat. <laughs> I don't know. Can you Who break that word up? down for us? To I, tell us T -E -C -O -V -I -R -A -M -A T E C O V I R A M A T. I I I intended to ask somebody how they come up with this name. Exactly. But they got somebody on drugs working uh -huh. on the name yes. for these drugs. They that that is actually a really challenging process. Yeah. Because they've got to come up with a name that will be memorable, especially for physicians, True. that isn't already used for some other product, um, and that hopefully gives some kind of indication of what this thing might do yeah like things that end in mabs or mon monoclonal antibodies, monoclonal antibodies. Right. right this this has veer veer in it which suggests it's an antiviral right right um could have been but, viristat yeah. i would have picked viristat no rather don't than know matt well might already so be i used. think it might have been on twiv someone once picked as a pick an article by someone who Talked all about the naming oh. of drugs and how, as, yeah. as Alan said, there's certain things you have to do, and you want to have catchy names, you know that. But this is the name of the drug. Great one, and you find out that Hyundai made a car called that or something. Yeah, but you this know, is just, not the name of the drug. This is a trade name. This is a yeah, yeah, of course. Understood. This is not the chemistry of this yeah, drug, yeah. right? So that's yeah, even think, more removed. Yeah. Not only that, it's got another name. Uh, I'm sure, uh, like to Topox or something. Tope? Like that. Yes. T -O -P -O -X. Is that what you use it for? Topox. No. <laughs> right. So one of those is going to be the marketing name of it, and the right. other is going to be the um, the generic name of it. That's right. That's right. That's right. 
Although, frankly, I don't think there will be a generic of this introduced anytime soon because the market is pretty much saturated as soon as they release this. <laughs> yeah, they got one buyer. Yeah. So, uh, which is the U.S. government. So, at any rate, let me give some. Uh, th- this was interesting for me because, first of all, being at the meeting was interesting. It was a, a fascinating process. Uh, secondly, uh, this drug has a long history, and we've uh, followed it almost from well, not from the get go, but we've we've followed a lot on Twitter. I have followed it from the get go, um, and so it was interesting to see it uh, come to this stage. And probably most important, it was a good test of the animal rule, which I will um, elaborate on as we go on. First, a little history of the drug. Um, <clears throat> I think it's important to note that. The, uh, uh, everybody remembers, of course, September 11th, uh, when airplanes flew into the twin towers, people may not remember as clearly that five days or so after that, there was the anthrax incident where somebody distributed, uh, anthrax through spores through the mail to, uh, several senators and congressmen and other official types, uh, five people, I think in that died and it set off a real panic. The combination of those two was what really, um, uh, initiated or boosted the whole biodefense effort by the government. So that's in 2001. Real complex, as I think. (laughs) Okay, fine. Uh, So uh, a company called uh, Virofarma, which I don't believe exists at all anymore. Certainly, their uh, R and D no longer exists. uh, Was one of several companies to investigate antivirals. Oh, by the way. in the biodefense effort, uh, the government has identified class A, B, and C uh, agents uh, as being, you know, class A being the biggest threats to biodefense. And these, you can look these up. We can even put a link in the show notes if you want. Uh, c- category A pathogens include anthrax, botulism, plague, smallpox, tularemia, and a number of different viral hemorrhagic fevers. fevers. Um Dengue, Ebola, Marburg, etc. So these are things that the government consists uh, 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 considers uh, uh, primary tools uh, or good candidates for bioterrorism, and that we need to have some defense for. And they said we need a vaccine and one or two antivirals for uh, each of these if we can. And so several biotech companies stepped up to research this stuff and Virofarma screened a library of something like a half a million compounds uh, in an assay that included cowpox, uh, which is a close relative of variola, which is the smallpox virus. Um, And in about 2002, came up with their first hit and did uh, some chemistry on that to refine it. And that was the birth of uh, ST246. And in fact, uh, in those in that first year or two, I was actually called up to Virofarma to talk to them because the guy who was doing it, Rob Jordan, was actually trained as a herpes virologist. So he was kind of winging it with pox viruses, and they just wanted to check in with somebody who did pox viruses for a living and and make sure they were on uh, not doing something foolish, which they weren't at all. Virofarma went under in about uh, 2004, or at least, uh, uh, discontinued their R and D at which point, uh, the, uh, biotech company called SIGA S I G A in Oregon, uh, whose chief scientific officer is a guy named Dennis Ruby, who I've known since 1977 when we did postdocs together at Stony Brook. Hmm. Uh, uh, so they acquired, uh, everything necessary, and I don't know all the legal stuff, to pursue this. They took over a grant, uh, I, I presume that uh, involves purchasing some licensure and that kind of stuff. And they also hired Rob Jordan, who was the scientist who got the first hit. And Rob really, at the bench, drove a lot of the science from then on. Uh, and so they developed this drug, <clears throat> uh, trying to, uh, you know, the – the end goal is that the U.S. government would stockpile this in the event of a bioterrorist event uh, involving smallpox. Now, uh, the 
issue here is that since this is a an infection, a smallpox only infects humans and kills them 30% of the time. You can't do clinical trials with a drug in humans. Mm -hmm. And so the FDA came up with the idea of what is called the animal rule, which is that if you could um, come up with a couple of good animal models uh, and demonstrate efficacy in the animals, and then you would have to do safety trials in humans, identify from the animal models what you think is an appropriate dose, and uh, recruit volunteers to take this drug uh, and make sure it doesn't uh, hurt them, um, then you could use the animal models and the human uh, safety testing uh, to gain approval of the drug. But, you know, in the beginning, uh, it was light on details. And I think, you know, for seven or eight years between uh, their uh, SIGA's original acquisition of the drug in 2004 and a critical FDA meeting in 2011, they kind of bantered back and forth where SIGA would say, well, you know, it works in this and it works in this and it works in this. And the FDA would say, well, that's okay, but not really. And they'll say, well, what do you want? They'll say, well, we're not sure, but when we see it, we'll know. Rich, can I interrupt <laughs> you just one moment? Yeah, sure. D did they discover this drug without actually knowing how it works? No, I'm getting to how it works. Okay, they, fine. They I didn't want to preempt it. it. Yes, they discovered it initially without knowing how it works, right. but uh, so, subsequently figured out how it works. Okay. okay and I'll get to that. Okay. So in 2011, there was a critical FDA meeting where uh, all of the research to then to that point uh, came together and they uh, defined and clarified uh, the animal rule. Um, and uh, there's a We'll link to a document here that SIGA used, that SIGA uh, submitted to the FDA for this uh, meeting that <clears throat> actually details uh, what the animal rule is. But in this particular case, they came away from that uh, understanding that they were going to uh, use two of three possible models. Uh, one was monkeypox in non-human primates, uh, in this case, cinemologous macaques. And I think it was pretty well understood that that would uh, be one of them. And one of uh, two others, either uh, rabbit pox in rabbits or ectromelia, which is mouse pox in mice. And they wound up choosing uh, rabbit pox in rabbits. Uh, ideally, you'd like to do this with the smallpox virus itself. Uh, and ideally, you'd do that in a suitable animal model, hopefully uh, non-human primates being uh, close to humans. But um, uh, variola did not behave really well or reproducibly in any of the animal models. And, and they, they, it really wasn't good. Plus, there's a problem in you know having to do all the variola research in high, high containment. But uh, monkeypox uh, in uh, synomologous monkeys and uh, vaccinia in rabbits uh, served the purpose. Uh, so let me go on just briefly to uh, uh, mechanism, because it's interesting. The drug inhibits spread of the virus. And if you go back to TWIV68, my favorite, <laughs> ode, to a, ode to a Plaque, you will learn about uh, pox virus spread. So the virus um, <clears throat> goes through an assembly process in the cytoplasm and assembles a particle in the cell that's actually infectious. If you break open the cells and isolate those particles, you can infect other cells with it. Uh, but then a small fraction of those, maybe 1% or so, not a, not a large fraction, then gets wrapped in a, a second membrane and exocytosed as a double membrane virus called extracellular envelope virus. And that's the virus that's responsible for cell to cell and tissue, tells of cell spread and tissue to tissue spread in an organism. And there are several virus proteins that are critical for that uh, process. One of them called F13 is apparently the target of this drug. They know that because you can uh, isolate viruses that are resistant to the drug and they map to that gene. Okay. So, you know, initially people thought, man, 
geez, it inhibits spread. That's not necessarily going to be enough for this to be effective. But it turns out that the drug is actually quite effective in just inhibiting spread. And there's some uh, advantages to that in a way because uh, you can actually, <clears throat> uh, under many circumstances, uh, vaccinate people even in the uh, perhaps even in the presence of the drug. And you get enough replication to get an immune response. Uh, but um, uh, the drug will uh, still work. So you could uh, theoretically apply drug and antiviral at the, I mean, vaccination and antiviral at the same time. At any rate. Um, okay. So this thing, this thing inhibits a protein that's necessary for the virus to get its final envelope to spread to another cell. That's correct. And that is going to slow down the course of infection to the point that the host is um, their their immune system's going to be able to hopefully that's catch correct. up. Correct, the immune system catches up with it, and that's so, so and it's that's kind critical. Of, it's almost like a chemical um, version of variolation. Uh, I suppose, in a way. I mean, and in fact, uh, in in fact, Dixon's comment that it ought to be called Tecavira Stat <laughs> makes sense because right. it stops the infection from you know it doesn't kill the virus. It stops the infection from spreading. Right. Are there any temperature mutants of viruses that only replicate in lower temperatures than body temperature? Yeah, there's a bear shit in the woods. No, no, uh, serious. Yeah. Was, you, you mean you mean a cold adapted virus? That yeah, I mean a cold adapted virus. Like they have. For, I've heard of those. Toxoplasma has have a mutant. You ever gotten flu mist? Yeah, no, I never, I, I never did get flu mist. No, we got injected together, don't you remember? We always went over and got injected. Yeah, no, yeah I'm just being silly. Yes, okay. there are. But you know, but, okay, fine. And that's why it works, because it's so slow in replicating, it gives the immune system a chance to catch up. Well, because it's compartmentalized, flu mist is um, okay. presumably just, just replicating the nasal passages. It's not getting into your lungs. Yeah, yeah right. It keeps it out of the lung. Right. Yeah. Right. So in the case of te getting back to tecopyramat, this is, this is different. It's important to point out. This is not giving the, the virus, um, but it, it's slowing down the virus long enough that yeah. you can mount an immune yeah. response. Right, yeah. So at any rate, at this meeting, uh, without go, uh, I can go into details on some of the animal studies uh, if you like, but without uh, without doing that at least immediately, what what happened was that uh, SIGA uh, presented uh, their sort of summary data on the drug, and that's all in this uh, document that's uh, available to the public, and we can put in the show notes uh, summarizing the animal trials with monkeypox in uh, monkeys and um, vaccinia, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, rabbit pox in rabbits. Uh, and also, uh, and those showed that it's effective in those two animal models. And they did have other, a bunch of other dosing and pharmacokinetic studies in those animals and in other species as well to try and uh, determine what the maximum tolerable dose was. And they took the most conservative version of that. And they also, from these studies, could uh, make a prediction in at, at least those two animal models with some other data as well as to how much free drug you had to have in your blood in order to be inhibitory as well. And from that, they uh, came up with an appropriate human dose and recruited uh, human volunteers. And there's, they did several trials and there's as many as 700, I think total, but one trial had over one critical trial had over 300 uh, participants uh, and gave them the, you know, dose they came up with was 600 milligrams twice a day with food. This is oral, uh, eight, oral, right? Oral mm -hmm. and gave this, uh, uh, drug to them and did all the appropriate uh, pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, determined that the blood concentrations of the drug uh, were appropriate, even in fact better in terms of free drug than in the animal models. And so it should be uh, effective in the humans uh, at those uh, doses and took uh, note of any adverse effects uh, of which there were, uh, there were no there were no serious adverse effects attributable to the drug. There were a couple of people who had some problems. In fact, one person who died of a pulmonary embolism, uh, but that was determined that person had a lot of pre-existing conditions because they include a whole range of people in the study. Um, <clears throat> that person had uh, pre-existing conditions that 
uh, led to that. And it was uh, determined that that was not due to the drug. Uh, at any rate, so it's efficacious in two animal models and uh, safe in humans uh, at an appropriate dose. SIGA gave their prep uh, presentation. The FDA representatives stood up and gave their presentation, which was basically going through much of the same stuff and uh, saying that, you know, we basically agree that uh, SIGA has uh, satisfied the conditions of the animal uh, rule uh, with with these studies. It was a, uh, like it was some kind of love fest, right? <laughs> it was un- unbelievable to have the applicants in the FDA basically on the same page. It was kind of like a, you know, in a way, kind of like a thesis defense. There's been a whole bunch of stuff going on. It was, you know. Um, yeah, my, but, my understanding is that that's not uncommon. Yeah. Makes it, because sense. because for a company to get to the point of of the FDA convening the advisory panel and bringing people in for this, um, they've been talking to the FDA all along, and they've been back and forth, and and all the hard meetings have already happened. I should say that uh, another interesting uh, thing, uh, part of the SIGA's presentation, is five different cases where the drug has been used on a compassionate use. Uh, basis. And we've discussed two or three of these on TWIV in the past, uh, where people have a runaway vaccination and they're in trouble, uh, and, uh, the drug is used. Now those, and those all worked out well, the cases were resolved. Actually, there was one that was uh, a couple of weeks ago, we did a cowpox infection, uh, and, um, Dixon asked whether you could use this drug to treat the cowpox infection. And in fact, it turns out that one of the uh, compassionate use cases was a cowpox infection uh, in Finland. Okay. Those all, you know, in the end, those, you can't do statistics with those. They're all anecdotal. But in, in, in every case where the uh, drug was used, the disease uh, resolved uh, without any uh, adverse effects. And so those make uh, interesting case descriptions. Uh, the other thing about the meeting is that, of course, it, it was a public meeting. And so people had an opportunity, the public had an opportunity to uh, present uh, uh, questions or material uh, in support or against uh, the approval of the drug. And the panelists were from all over the place. There were you know, people from the government, there were people uh, who were uh, knowledgeable about regulatory issues. There were basic scientists like myself and some others who had experience in uh, animal models. There were private physicians. There was a patient representative. I don't know how she was recruited, uh, whether she had direct experience with this or uh, I I'm intended to uh, ask her, but I didn't get a chance. Uh, and so these presentations were made, the public had an opportunity to ask questions, the panel had an opportunity to ask questions, and then the end of vote was taken by the uh, voting members, and it was 17 to 0 for uh, approval. So that is a, <clears throat> that's a recommendation. The FDA meets later, like in June or something like that, to consider whether uh, what to do with that recommendation and whether to make a final approval. So it's a, re- a recommendation, it's get- recommendation to approve this drug is that the that's reason? correct and if unanimous the, recommendation and if the fda then approves it what will happen next um they'll well uh i not much i don't <laughs> think because in, in, in this fact case, it's already much. it's already being stockpiled so they're already paid okay. for it they've given sega the money uh i believe so okay there's about there, there uh, there's be, over there a million doses some. already that have been uh stockpiled yeah, I, uh, I don't know what the exact deal is, but there might be some kind of um, uh, additional payment in the works that would come only if this thing gets approved or something like that. And it, is this being frozen or is it lyophilized? You know, I think uh, it's a it is uh, it's a powder. Okay, uh, and it's kept at room temperature. And, and what is and the actual chemical structure of this thing? Uh, you can look it up. Dihydroxy chicken wire. That's that's a bad. <laughs> yes. uh, okay. No, it's a it's it's a funny looking compound. Okay. Um, How, but what is the you, shelf life of this thing? Uh, you know, I got that for you right here. Two weeks, huh? <laughs> um, so it's at least good for up to seven years. Okay. Wow. Uh, and that's you know as long as as long as they've uh, been testing it. Um, How many and, doses did they stockpile again? Two million. Uh, I think it's 
Uh, let me see. Hang on. So, uh, I think it's over. Uh, it's over a million. All right. Uh, and it wants, I don't. I don't have the exact number. Um, and uh, there's, I think, uh, more purchase gonna happen. Uh, right. And then they have uh, a shelf life extension. Pro- I love this. A shelf life extension program uh, to, you know, would be nice to uh, extend it, extend the shelf life beyond uh, seven years. But I would imagine that that would involve like uh, taking the existing drug and right. testing it against new drug and that kind of stuff. But I love it. The stel- shelf life extension program is um, acronym is SHLEP. <laughs> really i think it's good yeah okay. so another H-L-E-P. question is, is 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 this is not a natural product right this is a chemical synthesized that's correct yes product. okay now if another country wanted to buy this are they allowed to sell it to them i don't know i don't know the answer to that the what the uh uh what the approval does more than anything else is it makes its use a lot more straightforward mm-hmm. okay uh and uh, i think uh, this is just me talking, but one of the things that I've been given to understand is the uh, military won't use any drug that's not FDA approved because hmm. they've gotten in trouble before. Yeah, yeah. Right. And uh, and so and the military is uh, likely to be one of the places where you might see this uh, used. Uh, and so that's. Uh, the approval in that case is huge. There was somebody on the committee during the discussion asked, by the way, I think I don't know. It was webcast. I don't know if that's archived or not, but you might be able to see the whole thing. Um, somebody on the committee said, well, we're already stocking it and we can use it for compassionate use. Uh, why do we even need to approve it? And without going into any kind of detail, uh, one of the government people on the committee and several others just, you know, erupted in uh, <laughs> approval makes a huge difference. Okay. And my guess is that it's just that approval makes a huge difference in terms of uh, access to the drug. Yes. So, Rich, I, Rich I, do you think there'll be any international uptake for this or, you know, other know. governments, other countries? I There's no know. mention of that. Okay. Well, It'll depend on discussed. how uptight they are about uh, the the possibility of bioterrorism. This varies tremendously from country to country. A lot of so, other countries think that we're being ridiculous. There was, uh, there was. I'll tell you, if there was ever a problem, that attitude would change quickly. Oh, well, of course it would. <laughs> if there's yeah, ever a problem, you know, that's the question. Um, <laughs> well, unfortunately, Alan, we are being ridiculous as a country. Well, that's other for other reasons, reasons. <laughs> for tons of reasons. Yeah. So I have well, a question. actually, uh, uh, in that same vein, one of the discussions that went on was, uh, is this, I mean, obviously it's been used in a couple of compassionate, uh, care cases. Uh, the other question is, and we've discussed this before, uh, would it be useful in, uh, other pox virus infections? Right. Like, uh, like for example, monkey pox, it's active against all of the ortho pox viruses, which include, Varial of the smallpox virus, vaccinia, the vaccine, uh, monkeypox, which is a rodent virus, but that gets into humans and is transmissible in humans and has a, a like a as high as a ten percent mortality rate. So it's a it's a problem, uh, in particular in outbreaks in Africa, and ectromelia, which is mousepox, and uh, and rabbitpox. Those are the ortho oh and cowpox. Those are the orthopox viruses, and it's active against uh, all of those. And so there was significant discussion about uh, once the approval happens, uh, the extent to which it might be used in those. And monkeypox is a little problematic just because of where it is. Um, but I wouldn't be, I personally, I wouldn't be surprised to see it uh, perhaps used uh, in that situation and some other situations as well. So now, how far into smallpox infection will this work? Ah, very good question. Of course. Uh, and that was part of the uh, uh, animal testing. And this was a very interesting part of the animal testing. And constructing the animal models, uh, they did their best, and they did a very good job, of defining the pathogenesis uh, uh, of the virus in the animal so that there were basically, uh, well, several criteria. One, it had to be reproducible. 
Two, it had to have a defined and relevant endpoint, which in this case is death. Okay, that they could that they could measure and get statistics on. And three, the actual uh, pathogenesis of the infection had to present a reproducible sequence of symptoms that hopefully, at least in one case, were close to what you see in humans and would provide a recognizable what they call trigger so that you can say when this happens, that's when we'll say you have the disease and we're going to treat you with the drug. Because, you know, in, in the case of smallpox, you don't get any symptoms at all for uh, on the order of 10 days after exposure. And then you have a prodrome that can last for, I think, up to a week that's, uh, you know, headache, nausea. You feel really lousy, but it's not obviously smallpox. And it's not until after that, so you're almost three weeks into the infection, when um, you get skin lesions and you know it's smallpox. Okay, Rich, what point uh, of that uh, prodromal do you are you contagious? Uh, you are con- you start to be contagious uh, when you actually have the first prodromal symptoms. Got it. Okay, in the in the during the incubation period prior to that, when you have no symptoms. Uh, you're not contagious. And so there's a couple airborne of airborne or fluid born? Uh, both. It's right. mostly airborne. You mostly right. acquire it as a respiratory infection. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so in the monkeypox model, they decided, based on the reproducibility of the model, that the trigger was going to be the first appearance of uh, skin lesions. All right. Uh, which is now in the monkey in the monkeypox model, it's not actually not they can't do a reproducible infection. I'm not sure they can do a well. They can't do a reproducible infection by a respiratory route. They gave it to them intravenously, so they skip essentially that incubation period um, and go into the. By the time you get a prodrome, you have a viremia. You got virus circulating in your blood, so they skip all the. Uh, primary uh, viremias and the and stuff that happens in the incubation period. Uh, and the minute you show up with lesions, that's the trigger and they start giving drug, which is like four days after the interve- intravenous uh, injection of the virus. So they give the virus, uh, they wait to see lesions, and then they give the drug. And they did dosage studies and they also did studies to see how long you had to give it and how long you could delay it. And basically what they came up with is that in that model, uh, you can wait up to four or five days uh, and give the drug and still have effect. And you had to give it for a minimum of five or six days. I don't know that I've got those so, numbers So you can exactly. wait four or five days after the appearance of the first lesion? Uh, I believe so. Okay. Uh, the probably. timing sounds right. It's this figure one in the executive summary. Yeah, I think so where it shows the antiviral drug arrow right. kind of ending about four days after the beginning of the eruption. Right. Right. I think that's correct. Uh, so they did those studies. It was, it's, it's clear that you could have somebody it's clear. Let's put it this way. It's clear that it's effective enough, at least in the animal model, so that you could have somebody who's had symptoms for a couple of days and dose them with the drug and have an effect. And what's right. death okay. from, uh, the death, uh, in the is uh, CNS? Uh, no, it's what do they call it? They call it septicemia. It's not, it's, it's uh, basically multiple organ failure. Uh, this is in the case of smallpox, and I believe that uh, in the animals as well, um, it, uh, in, it infects uh, multiple organ systems. And so they start to fail, but right. there's also a uh, cytokine storm. Okay. Right. Shock. Right. Okay. Septic shock. That's what it's septic called. Shock. Septic shock. Okay. That's from the release of all the proteins from the dying cells. Uh, yeah. And from your immune system going right. bonkers. Right. So, mm-hmm. so uh, um, I want to get this uh, timeline stuff right. Protection was greatest when Tecaviramat was initiated on day four or five and that at least five days of treatment was sufficient to demonstrate survival damage. Now, actually, that is day four or five 
after administration, after okay. uh, uh, giving monkeypox. Okay. Uh, and in this model, day four is when the lesions first arise. Right. There's fever going on before that. So you can give the, so day four is, uh, uh, day five. If they give it much after day five, uh, then they get decreased effectiveness. So you'd better give it, uh, if the monkey model is right, you better give it immediately when you see a rash. You can't wait five days after you first see a rash. Okay. It's five days, five, uh, six days after you first administer uh, the drug, uh, it has a decreased effect. So you want to get it to people um, the Soon minute the rash they show shows up. With up. But yeah. you know what's going to happen. I mean, if this ever came to it, is that you're going to have a bunch of people who've been exposed. Yes. Um, and it's, they're going to want the drug. Yes. Okay. Well, and it seems to me that there's these two to three days of fever before that. So before the rash right. appears. So right. you might say, okay, we'll do it when you have the fever for this right. amount of time or this amount of fever. Yeah. You're going to do You're going to do a ring containment and just go in and, and probably prophylactically, prophylactically give this to a whole bunch of people who've been exposed. Right. So day six, I think had, decreased so if you wait two okay. days after the appearance of the drug it's not as good but uh on the day of the uh, i'm sorry the appearance of the lesions but on the right. first day of lesions or the second day of lesions you're okay um the, the only other thing i wanted to say is that this now is going to be a landmark in the use of the animal rule yes because a lot of this whole thing was figuring out what the animal rule really was um, and, uh, now they have a clear definition, at least in, uh, one case, uh, and there are going to be other, uh, antivirals out there like things against Ebola and et cetera, where you have the same problem. You right. can't do the tests in humans. Uh, and they will point to this process in defining the animal rule, I'm sure. So this is a, an addition to Koch's postulates, basically. You go back to the original. Uh, if you can't replicate the disease in another animal, then uh, they had some kind of a statement to make about the uh, pathogenicity of the organism, right? But many of them are specific only to human, like you've got here. Right. And cholera is another one like that, and you've got a lot of malarias like that as well. So Koch's postulates don't apply to those at all. Never were perfect. I know. More of a guideline. I understand. <laughs> but ironically, Coke was the first guy to isolate cholera. <laughs> yeah. His own rule yeah. didn't apply. <laughs> All right. Let's, uh, can we move on? Are we done with that? Yeah. Thank you, a, Rich Condit. Your work is yeah, finished. Yeah, well, it was great. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> that's, that's a snippet with many A's in between the So A's. you have no more work to do with uh, STS-246, right? Uh, who knows? I mean, I didn't th think I'd have ST. this work to do with <laughs> ST246. ST, I said STS because that was the shuttle <clears throat> numbering. The shuttle right. mission, right. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, and let's hope that we never have to use this. You're here. Right. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. A million doesn't sound like a lot um, <laughs> mm -mm. in an outbreak situation. Right. All right. Uh, we have now a, a continuance of a an arc, another TWIV arc dealing with norovirus and particularly murine norovirus's and the question we've been wrestling with and others of course they're doing the experiments we just talk about them is where are the murine norovirus's replicating and last time or a few times ago we heard about them persistent strains replicating in tuft cells we did hear that and today we're going to look at some acute strains of murine norovirus and see where they replicate. And this paper was published in Nature Microbiology. It is entitled, The Major Targets of Acute Norovirus Infection Are Immune Cells in the Gut-Associated Lymphoid Tissue. This comes from a, a number of groups at the University of Florida in Gainesville. Where? Which is, of course, <laughs> where Rich Condit is an emeritus professor. Exactly. <laughs> and it is from the laboratory of Stephanie Karst. And the first three authors contributed equally, Katrina Grau, Alexa Roth, and Shuzu. And uh, 
By the way, uh, have we had Stephanie on? I, I don't remember. Yes. We have. Yes. Okay. Wow. What did she talk about? Norovirus? <laughs> if she talked about norovirus. <laughs> I think yeah. she talked about norovirus, yes. So, I so will, long, I I will remember, find it while we're remember. talking here. All right. So this is a paper looking at, as I said, the acute strain, different from the viruses used in the paper uh, where they looked at tuft cells. And as you can tell from the title, replicates. They don't mention tuft cells here at all. I presume they were there. So these acute strains have different uh, tropisms. And that was TWIV-134. TWIV wow. Meet, meet, Ralph, Ralph, your meet Ralph, your cruise director. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was uh, May 2011, so seven years ago. It's a long wow. time. So this the, the main technique here is very cool. It's called RNA scope in C2 hybridizations. Hybridization. RNA scope. And, and we should talk about it a bit because it's pretty cool because it allows you to identify, you know, virus infected individual cells in tissues and also to say what kind of cells they are by using uh, RNAs that tell you that, you know, markers. And the RNA scope is a, the, the, the key here is a probe design strategy, which gives you, which amplifies the signal and at the same time keeps the background down. So you have a good signal to noise ratio here. And what you would do is you would have a tissue and you would formal and fix it, paraffin embed it and slice it up so that you could look at it in a microscope. And then you can hybridize your probe to the sections and then you can detect the hybridized nucleic acid using uh, chromogenic dyes if you just want to look in a regular microscope or fluorescent dyes if you want to look under a UV scope. And there you could also do multiplexing. You can have, look at virus and cell markers at the same time, whatever you want it to do. So the difference between this and in situ hybridization is the fact, really, as Vincent said, that you can multiplex it and that you can really cut down on the background and look at single cells. So I found the original paper, and they have a lovely <laughs> sentence mm -hmm. here which says, Unlike grind and bind RNA analysis yes. methods such grind as real time, <laughs> real time RT PCR, RNA scope brings the benefits of in situ analysis to RNA biomarkers and may enable rapid development of RNA ish based molecular diagnostic assays. Ish being in situ hybridization. In situ hybridization, not issues. And by the way, the, the RNA scope, the 2012 RNA scope paper that Vincent's referring to is now open access. So when we have the link to PubMed Central on there, it'll um, bring up the whole paper for people who want to look into this. So the way it works is you design, I think for a one kilobase region on RNA, you would target it with 20 probe pairs. So two 14 base oligonucleotide probes. And these are in turn attached to a, a longer sequence that is then the target of what they call amplifiers, smaller RNAs that will hybridize to that, and those will have your label or your probe on it. So you can have, they, they say, if you sequentially hybridize the pre-amplifier, the amplifier in your probe, you can get 8,000 labels for each target RNA molecule. So, so part of this is that you have two oligos in pairs, and the fact is that the, it's unlikely that those two oligos would bind side by side at a non-specific site. So right. they have to bind side by side. And so uh, as the student in Christiana Vobus's lab who told me about this, uh, put it, think of this as two halves of a Christmas tree stand. And they have to bind side by side to give you the whole tree. Christmas tree stand. Mm. And then you bind to that the trunk, and that's the preamplifier. And it's only going to hybridize to those two things side by side. And that's the trunk. And then you have amplifier molecules that are the branches, and then there are labels that uh, will interact with the branches. And she says, think of those as the ornaments on the Christmas tree. <laughs> <laughs> so you have the Christmas tree stand, the trunk, the branches, and the ornaments. And that's uh, how you get this uh, really good amplification that's specific. And for a Jewish investigators, that's a Hanukkah bush, by the way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and you could probably put together some kind of a menorah metaphor. You could, you could, you could. Right. So the likelihood that in a, if they get background, you would be 
hybridizing to something off target. So it's unlikely that these two 14 base hybrid primers would hybridize next to each other, which is required for assembling the tree. So you get right. much lower. So it's two-factor authentication. For it's two-factor authentication. There you go. Yeah. There you go. So it's a very cool technique, and uh, they use it extensively mm. in this paper. So to dive into what they actually do, they have uh, this virus is called MN MNV1, Murine Norovirus 1, which is establishes an acute infection in mice. Again, different from the one we studied last time, which goes a long period of time. So they, you know, if you orally infect these mice, 24 hours is the peak of acute infection. And they can then either measure virus or they can take out tissues uh, and look at RNA scoping them, or you can uh, measure virus production as well. So um, they tested their probes to make sure they're all good. They infect with 1 times 10 to the 7th TCID50s orally. They collect tissue at 24 hours, which I said is the peak of infection, and they take three pieces. They divide the small intestine into three pieces, 1, 2, and 3, and the colon is separate, uh, and then they will be processed in a way that we'll tell you in a minute. But uh, they, they hybridize RNA, the, the samples, uh, to make sure their probe is okay, and they have lots of controls that show that the virus probes work, housekeeping genes work, nonspecific bacterial probes do not give you a signal. The assay is good. And the, the three pieces of intestine they take are, um, they keep <clears throat> track of them from proximal to distal. So we're starting we're starting at the stomach end and going to the, um, to the colon end. Ilium. Right. Ilium. The ilium, yes. <laughs> and the odyssey. <laughs> now, they, they do an interesting... Um, technique for looking at these entire pieces instead of making billions of s sections they do what's called a swiss roll have you done a swiss roll dixon i have actually i studied an intestinal parasite trichinellosis trichinellus so spiralis did that all the made swiss rolls did it all the time. And so there's a i've done dutch rolls but i was i was interested here <laughs> the swiss roll is not capitalized it's interesting hmm. why, why wouldn't it be i don't know hmm. but it's Cassie, it sounds like you've done this too, in the, in right? the paper <laughs> Yeah, we've done them in art lab, but we were introduced to them as jelly rolls, but whatever. <laughs> it's yeah. funny that you would call these intestinal things rolls of any sort. But. <laughs> well, but the the process for making them, they take so they take one of these gut sections and we have a couple of video links for people who want to watch the process. <laughs> um the gut sections are maybe a couple inches long each. Um and then you slit it down the middle and flatten or not. it out. Or not, right? Apparently, Kathy was saying that sometimes you don't, but then you you just take this whole piece of of intestine and roll it up on itself, and then you turn it sideways exactly. like a like a, what is apparently called a Swiss roll. I think of it as a Danish. Some people would call it a coffee roll. Um, <laughs> and then they're going to look. They're going to slice it um, horizontally uh, from there. Yeah, the first. So you get course, to look at a lot of tissue. You get to see a yeah, lot. That's of the beauty. You look at all. They, in the movie that I saw, they wrapped it around a toothpick. Yeah. And mm -hmm. then they put it in a, a, a fixative little cage, Use and you drop mess. it into formalin. Then you can then you can embed it in paraffin. You can slice it up. Yep. And you see the whole length of what you're looking at in exactly. one swirl. Exactly. It's pretty mm -hmm. clever, exactly. right? Very clever. Mm -hmm. And otherwise, you'd so have to this, make a lot of sections. This, got it right. Uh, critical to what they were doing here is that they would take one of these Swiss rolls and take several sections uh, through it, okay? Not just one four. section through it, yeah, but several. But sections. still, in a, given, in a given Swiss roll from a portion of the uh, small intestine, they took, I think, five sections. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. But those sections are separated by... 500 microns, because I talked to Stephanie specifically about this. I says, my understanding that you take a section and then you move down and you take another section. They aren't adjacent sections. And she said, yeah. And uh, uh, Katrina, uh, one of the one of the first authors on the paper, did the calculation one time and came up with that they're really only looking at about 1% of the whole tissue. Okay. Right, because each section should ideally be about a cell thick, right? 
Something like that, yeah. A couple, couple of cell. You they want the light microscope yeah. and they're, everything. To yeah, they're four they can't be microns. Too thick. They're four, four microns, microns thick. thick every five hundred. So, so microns. you have this this Swiss roll that is, um, I don't know, maybe half a centimeter thick, and you're you're slicing through it and taking these little little thin sections from five different portions of it. So you are seeing a it's lot of light. intestine, but you're not seeing the whole intestine. And we also should also point out that we are using probes to detect both viral plus and minus strand RNA. So right. the plus strand, of course, is the viral genome, and the minus strand would only be made in a cell in which the plus strand has been replicated. So it's so an, yeah, an actively infected or productively infected cell. So they see, uh, so they they get viruses out, they get virus production in these intestines, of course, and then they look for the for the probing. They see fo- fo- foci of viral infection using um, the plus strand probe, and they see it in the second and third sections of the intestine, and, but minimal to none in the first small intestine and in the colon. Now, when we say second and third sections, we're not referring to the sections of the Swiss roll we were just talking about. We're referring to, yeah. this gets a little topologically confusing. Um, we're referring to the uh, the anterior and next section and then the third section would be the final you section could, you could call those segments if you like the duodenum yes, segments. Second, the third segment ilium, the jejunum and ilium those are the, those right. are the two. duodenum is next to the stomach the next is yeah. the uh, jejunum yeah. and then, and then there's the ilium i don't know if it, it corresponds to this uh, one two and three yeah. though you know yeah. I think they just said they took three consecutive pieces. So we'll right. just call them one, yeah. two, three. The, the distribution and of it, immune cells along those three are quite different. And that's yes. why they did them all. Implied in this, dis- uh, in this discussion is that the reason they had to do this is that these centers of infection that you see are really rare. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Uh, and so you could, uh, you could uh, <laughs> if you just took one section from each segment, um, you might miss it. And I think I, I think one of the most stunning pictures, in fact, is not in the article itself, but the supplementary data. Yes. Uh, figure 2B, where they show um, the five sections from right. each segment and from the colon. So you can appreciate how concentrated the infection is in a given uh, uh, section and how, uh, how sparse those centers of infection are. And there's a selection of this. Um, I guess we're going to include the link to the um, uh, the behind the paper piece on the Nature yeah. website, right? Uh, so Nature Microbiology is the paper, um, and they also do this sometime series called Behind the Paper. And th- this is written by the author. So Stephanie wrote this blog post, and it very conveniently includes a link. The paper itself is not open access, but if you follow the link in this um, Behind the Paper blog post, you get a version of it that's free with a small f, so you don't have to pay. You can get through without a paywall. <laughs> and also, the image at the top of that is a really nice image of these jelly rolls. And they and further down in that, what I, yeah, what I meant to mention when I started that was um, she's got a section for a, a little selection from the figure 2B that Rich was just talking about that shows uh, these uh, viral cities she refers to them as. So they do make a point of noting the sporadic nature, as Rich has said, but that yet they say a clear pattern emerged. Most of the virus-positive signal is in the gut-associated lymphoid tissue, or GALT, GALT. which is uh, pyrus patches and all the lymphoid follicles in them. And uh, the galt within the distal two-thirds of the small intestine, which are, of course, the jejunum and the ileum, that's the primary target. The proximal third, the duodenum, right, is uh, and the colon, they have modest support of infection, not a lot. So that's where the virus is from, from this study. Now, many sections were looked at to derive that conclusion. <laughs> Yes, and right. and 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 Stephanie uh, pointed out again in this blog post that it had long been assumed that noroviruses infect the upper small intestine. So the fact that they didn't find mm. much evidence there was a, an interesting new finding. All right, so now what cell types in the GALT are being infected? Okay, Question. so they use um, 
some markers to do this. And they looked at, <laughs> they started to count cells, and they said uh, there were an average of 335 subepithelial cells, 64 cells in the follicular epithelium, and 33 undefinable cells positive for minus strand RNA, viral minus strand RNA in these uh, number two and number three sections. And so that is, again, mostly uh, immune cells within the GALT. So it's within the associated lymphoid tissue, which has a cover of epithelial cells, right? And then below it are the, the lymphoid cells. So then they used, they added, they, they went to the, to the RNA scope using fluorescent markers where they could do multiplexing and added probes for the cell type. And they have a number of, of cell type specific probes, you know, the, the so-called CD markers for dendritic cells of various sorts, B cells, macrophages, T cells, and epithelial cells. So now they're doing RNA scope fish, RNA scope fluorescent in C2 hybridization. Um, and they could see these cells in the sections, and they found minus strand viral RNA in the CD, CD11 C positive CD4 minus dendritic cells. CD11 C positive, CD4 positive macrophages, CD19 positive B cells, and CD3 positive T cells. And the and T, T cells cell cell are a surprise. Is a T new, cells are a, a surprise. new result. Right. Very much. They didn't see them in. They didn't see it in the epithelial cells um, here at all. Whereas previously they had seen a little bit, but it's a sensitivity issue. But um, and then they, they say, okay, what happens in a RAG1 null mice, which do not have Peyer's patches? They're lacking the RAG1 gene. And they show that virus titers are substantially reduced in all intestinal regions of these mice, reduced but not eliminated, which means that there's a little bit of replication elsewhere, I presume, because um, it's not zero. Uh, and um, so that. And that might be in the epithelial cells. Could be. Yeah, could be. So the T cells is new, so they. Uh, infected a murine T cell line and found virus replication in the absence of cytopathic effects. It's non-lytic release of virus, so they get good virus release, but it doesn't kill the cells, which is really interesting. Yeah. Um, and then they went on and looked at the now. This thing is it's lytic in some of these other cell types, isn't it? Yeah, I believe it is lytic. That's where they were surprised in the T cell. Yeah. That it wasn't lytic. Yeah. They go on to look at the, the receptor that we've talked about before, the CD300 LF molecule. And in fact, the infectability of a variety of cell lines correlated with the production of that. Um, one thing I might mention to Stephanie and her colleagues is the difference between susceptibility and permissivity, which gets a little muddled here. But susceptibility just deals with the presence or absence of the receptor, and permissivity is everything beyond that. So, you know, she says at one point, non-permissive cells did not express appreciable levels of the receptor, but non-permissive may or may not be right because you, it's... They were non-susceptible. They're non-susceptible. Whether they're permissive or not, we don't know because they didn't put RNA in, which would tell you that. Oh, so there's some interesting final studies which are really cool. Um so we got T cells, we got immune cells in the pyrus patches, which are targets. Remember, B cells, macrophages, T cells, dendritic cells. Uh, and they note that capsid protein has been previously found in intestinal T cells from an immunocompromised patient chronically infected with norovirus. So maybe that uh, is, a, is a target of infection in people. Um, and they say our results are consistent with those of others where biopsies uh, show most antigen in the viral antigen in the intestinal lamina propria, which has the immune cells in it. And epithelial cells are a minor target of infection. So that's cool because you can say, well, we found this in mice, but looks like in humans you have similar findings as well. And they note that this lends significant weight to the power of the mouse model of infection. It's kind of like the power of yeast genetics, the power <laughs> of the mouse model. Someone the mighty wrote, mouse. Someone uh, wrote a comment today on one of my videos that the mouse should be given the Nobel Prize for its contributions to science. <laughs> <laughs> mouse wouldn't know what to spend that on. Certainly before Trump gets one. <laughs> so there you go. It's very interesting. So these are the acute strain. This is an acute strain, and it's clearly intestinal cells. 
It, they don't mention tuft cells. I don't oh. know if they would have seen them, though. Remember, they're pretty rare. But in the other paper with the persistent for. strain, only saw tuft cells. So those right. two strains are very different, which is something we worried about. We had a letter about last time, and now we think we have the the reason why. So I want to make at least three points. You should One, make four. <laughs> okay, I, I can make four. But the first point is that I've been thinking about this for a while and trying to figure out a mnemonic for susceptibility versus permissivity. And susceptibility, if I have it right, has to do with whether or not there's a receptor. Mm -hmm. Right. So both of those words have CEPT in them, receptor and susceptibility. Suscept okay, that works. <laughs> and yeah. so had... You know, I will be telling my students that and uh, yeah, people yeah, that, it's, it's you know, hard, it's want to try and remember them. that. It's hard to remember it if you don't use it. Because the words, yeah. yeah, the words kind of seem very similar in their meaning. Yeah. The right. second thing is that when they went to this cell by cell, oh, I already have my four points, yes. When they went to this <laughs> cell by cell analysis, um, the uh, fluorescence signal is not nearly as sensitive as the chromogenic mm -hmm, signal right. and they show that in their supplemental figure five and they say that whenever they did um immediately serial sections and probed one with the chromogenic probe and one with a fluorogenic the the fluor fluorescent probe um they always got more signal from the chromogenic probe so the fact that they were ident able to identify these uh cells uh with the fluorescent probes is really cool uh it took a lot of work and I had written to Stacy, uh, um, Stephanie, sorry, to find out um, how did they know how to outline the cells? Because if you look in the paper uh, in that figure two, where they're identifying which cells are infected, they actually have a white outline of the cells. And it's pretty hard to tell from the DAPI stain where a cell would be. And she said that, um, the again, the one of the first authors, the postdoc, Katrina, spent many hours looking for cells where she could definitively figure out the outline of this cell and see both the viral signal and the lymphoid cell marker signal in the same cell um, and so that she could be they could be convinced by that. And the fourth point is something that Vincent that you touched on, but I just wanted to reemphasize it. The fact is that they did see this CD300 LF, receptor expressed on the various lymphoid cell types, um, but the highest level seemed to be on the macrophages and the B cells, and then less on the T cells. And they also looked for these uh, this receptor expression on uh, some epithelial cells, which stain with a marker called EPCAM, and they um, barely saw it on their Pyers patch cells. Mm -hmm. But they did see some of it, so. Yep. Hey, anything else, folks? Well, that's uh, my four points, but we have a lot more in the show notes. <laughs> yeah, well, you, you yeah. can we can touch. On I that I just wanted it. to point out because in my correspondence with uh, Stephanie about this, she noted that, um, uh, in a discussion of uh, Craig's letter last week, we, I kind of stumbled over what the status was of the various culture systems. Right. And she oh. comments that as far as she's aware, several labs, including uh, their own, Stephanie's lab, are using the B-cell culture system, and multiple labs are using Mary Estes' enteroid system. Both systems still, still suffer from low virus yields, inability to reproducibly passage virus, and marked variability of virus-positive stools to replicate in them. Very much like the early days of HCV propagation, we now have a couple of systems which support infection, but they're finicky and low effi efficiency. But I think there are a bunch of great labs working to enhance robustness of both systems and will get there soon. Won't it be great when we can actually grow a human neurovirus stock and stop relying on people donating their poops while infected? <laughs> what else can it do with them? Yeah. yeah, right. <laughs> you know, I got to say, this is, uh, we've heard from Stephanie multiple times. Stephanie's always talking about doing things for the good of the field, which yeah. I think is, and that's the way it should be. Mm -hmm. right. It's not for the good of you, mm -hmm. <laughs> which a lot of people 
are, are motivated by, but it's for the whole field. So I think that's really great. Thank you. Another uh, thing. Also, I, yeah, go ahead, Kathy. I was going to say another thing I asked her about was um, the fact that when she looks at these host cells that uh, are markers for the immune cells, the those markers appear to be um, kind of localized in the cells. And I wondered why that was. And and the, so are the virus markers, but you can explain that by viruses replicating in factories in specific points. And she said that they were curious about that too, but they don't really have an answer. Although the uh, probe company says that they can uh, detect single molecules. So each dot could theoretically be one messenger RNA, but she's not sure she's buying that. At, and I think that would be the case because again, these are the fluorescent things. Mm -hmm. um, she, uh, But this RNA scope technology, um, in addition to being able to do it in the uh, fluorescence in C2 hybridization mode, you can use an analog of it in flow cytometry. And they tried to do that and be quantitative, but it was, it's pretty difficult. And nonetheless, she said, she jokes that this is the most expensive article that she's ever published in terms of what it <laughs> costs to generate the data. So the RNA scope technology is not cheap. You can also read what she re her thoughts on Craig's letter. That would be good. Oh, yes, definitely want to do that. So um, after hearing you discuss the state of the MNV field, I have a new appreciation for the confusing nomenclature of virus strains. As you guessed, if you're in the field, it makes perfect sense. LOL. Um, she said she thinks we hit perfectly on the virus strain differences and how uh, markedly different they are emerging to be. And they have differ differential rates of clearance. They prefer different parts of the gut and they elicit variable protective immune responses. One thing that I find fascinating, all these MNV strains currently studied in the field are about 87% genetically identical to one another, mm -hmm. while human norovirus strains can be much more genetically distinct. I'm always intrigued how much pathogenic and immunologic variability there may be among human noroviruses, considering how different the MNV strains behave in vivo. My only point of contention with Craig's comments is that one MNV strain is more wild than another. All of these strains were isolated from, from endemically infected mice, thus they can clearly be passaged naturally in mouse colonies. We primarily study MNV1.CW3 because it is more virulent than other strains, causing diarrhea and gastric bloating in interferon-deficient mice. Fun fact, human norovirus infection also causes gastric bloating, which results in its high incidence of vomiting. Mike Lassen, um, Lack, an um, emetic, emetic, sorry, Mike, nice. mice lack an emetic reflex, so they don't vomit, but they do get the same bloating. See stomach pictures below. So she included a picture uh, that you might also link to in the show notes of a really bloated uh, stomach. Yes. We also appreciate that it is cleared acutely, modeling the very rapid course of human norovirus infection. Other labs study CR6 or MNV3 because they establish a fascinating form of persistence. I think there is much to be learned on both fronts. I do think it's critical for the field to do parallel studies with the various virus strains so we can ensure phenotypic differences are truly virus strain specific instead of reflecting lab to lab variability. And luckily, Craig recently shared CR6 with us so we can do just that. And then she made a big point of saying, please send my congratulations to Craig on his tough cell story and his new position at Yale. There you go. And that arc probably isn't over. No. <laughs> oh, no. Noah's arc. No, we're we're no. sort of projectile uh, arcing this story. <laughs> exactly projectile right. arcing. Exactly yeah. right. Exactly projectile right. arcing is a That's good right. title. <laughs> All right. Let's do some, some letters here. Some email. First one comes from our friend Ken Stedman. In Oregon, dear Twiverati, quick follow-up to Twiv491. The great oxidation event is estimated to have taken place more than 2 billion years ago, long before the radiation of vertebrates, but I am sure that there were viruses then too. I think that we had said, Dixon, that the oxidation event, Two billion. you know, it allowed the vertebrates to yeah. expand. We didn't necessarily mean it was at the same time. No. It was just a bit later, like two billion years. Yeah, just, just a, a bit. A couple of billion just years. Just a wee bit. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Regarding viruses in amber, there was a publication by George Poinar and Roberta Poinar on right. inclusions in up to 100 million year old amber that look a lot like insect polyhedrosis viruses. 
and a possible trypanosomatid. Dixon might like this as well. Right. I know George Bornar, by the way. So I took a look at this paper, and indeed, I think this has come up before. It looks very familiar. But it's got picture. It's called Fossil Evidence of Insect Pathogens, published in the Journal of Invertebrate Pathology, mm. and it was published in 2005. So they have this amber, which is uh, between, they have pieces, six pieces between 15 to 100 million years old. And they just take pictures of it, um, light microscopy, and they say, well, I could see some trypanosomatids here, and I can't see any trypanosomatids. They just see blobs. I could see some icosahedral-looking <laughs> particles. Or crystals. Polyhedral inclusion bodies in, <laughs> in the mid-gut epithelial cells of um, the uh -huh. Burmese amber-biting midge. <laughs> uh -huh. So... Yeah, that's me. I'm sure there were viruses back then. So that's yeah, pretty that cool. one looks really convincing. You like that one? I think yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you th I think the DNA is probably all gone, right? Right. This guy George Pornar wrote a great book called Life in Amber. In case anyone's listening, Life in Amber. That's Life cool. in Amber. It's really a, a beautifully written book and beautifully illustrated. Okay. All right. Continuing with Ken. Unfortunately, as I was told by George himself, most electron microscopists are not wild about putting tree sap. <laughs> into their multi-million dollar microscopes. If any TWIV listeners would like to give this a try, please let me know. Right. Also, a shameless plug for our recent review, Astrovirology, Viruses at Large in the Universe, <laughs> in Astrobiology, which is a journal which discusses the evidence for really ancient viruses. The cover art by my co-author Aaron Berliner is really amazing, and he sends a picture of that. Uh, some of the press that picked up this article, considerably less so. Google, killer alien space viruses, if you dare. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks for the wonderful podcast. <laughs> Cheers, Ken, procrastinating from working on my coronavirus lecture for tomorrow morning. So the cover is a, is a phage in space with a constellation of stars outlining right. part of it. That's right. pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And you, you, you can get this article. I've also... Looked at this one during my uh, exam yesterday. I was looking at this one. <laughs> and, um, well, it's a lot of speculation, right? Because what else do we have about viruses uh, in space? We can't, we, we don't even, the only thing we can say is if there's life somewhere, there'll be viruses. Correct. And it looks like the UK tabloids picked up on this back in January. What did they do? <laughs> what did they do? Killer alien space viruses, which could wipe out humanity, may be terrifyingly common in our universe. And there's a little animated gif of, uh, green viruses dancing against a uh, <laughs> cosmos type background. Uh, killer viruses from outer space might be more common than we think. That kind of thing. Wow. They would like to scare Talk everyone. Talk about taking a story and running with they it. They would like to scare everyone. <laughs> uh, Alan, could you take the next one? Sure. Um, Lucian writes, hello again, Twisters. I forgot to add a couple of things. The above email is in reference to Twiv 488 and regarding your... Uh, Okay, so this is him walking in on the middle of a conversation. Um, so find the episode where Lucian previously wrote to us and There's, add these items to the yeah, letter. Yeah, that's right. That's, I think um, we, wrote a, he, we read his email last time, yeah. Okay, and regarding your thoughts on how to test if protein made it into a human brain, I can think of one possibility using PET. Uh, that's positron, positron emission tomography. Roland Strong's lab at Fred Hutch, Rebecca, Rebecca Abershell's lab, and Corey Ralston's lab, both at UC Berkeley, developed a siderophore-like molecule that can complex with zirconium-89, which is visible by PET. This siderophore zir zircon complex binds with high affinity to siderocalin, which can be conjugated to some other protein. The whole complex might be too large to properly represent how well or poorly the rabies protein alone would traffic into the brain, but it is an interesting means to connect imageable isotopes to protein. Mm. It provides a link to the paper. Interesting. Thank you, Lucian. And one more from Trudy. Kathy. Sure. Trudy writes, Dear Twivers, since you seem to be experiencing an email crisis, I felt it my responsibility to write in this week. I recall Alan mentioning on an episode in the distant past that the presence of antibiotics in our food is a major contributor to our current antibiotic crisis. I recently mentioned this to a veterinary friend of mine, and she disagreed with this statement, arguing that there are very strict guidelines in place for the withdrawal of drugs, a certain time before animal sacrifice. 
Animals are tested for residues of drugs at the time of sacrifice, and apparently, if residue levels are even remotely above guideline levels, the meat is not allowed to be sold, and there are very steep fines involved as well. Just jumping in, um, I knew that, and if I said other, if I said food and antibiotic in our food, I misspoke. Okay. Along the same lines, the flora found in conventionally raised beef and beef and antibiotic free raised beef appears to be statistically identical according to several studies. So the flora is statistically identical. Okay. Levels of resistance are also the same and there is no consistent reduction in resistance observed by raising beef without antibiotics. Below, I have provided links for the USDA residue testing program, a couple of links related to understanding animal drug withdrawal and its effects. The Food Animal Residue Avoidance Data Bank, FARAD, and a recent news story about the minimal impact of antibiotic use in beef on antibiotic resistance. This study is supposed to publish soon. So there's uh, several different links that she's provided. There's a lot of evidence that by the way, that even though the animals don't have the antibiotics, they excrete it into the environment, and that has a big effect on the ecology of the areas. So it's it's not without effect. It's just without our food effect. Right. For the record, I'm not on either side of this debate. I just don't know what to make of it and thought it might be some good food for thought. Uh, Thanks, hard. Trudy. Uh, it's, it's a good bit more complicated than just beef and That's right. Just looking at the intestinal flora, as Dixon just alluded to, um, and I'm putting in a couple of links. One is totally self-serving. It's to a video that I produced about a year ago, uh, about a five-minute video. And the one after that is to a New York Academy of Sciences meeting, um, and uh, I guess is also self-serving because I wrote the summary of that meeting, which delves deeply <laughs> into this subject. Exactly. So we have talked about this on TWIM quite a bit. It's not about you eating no. Antibiotics in food. It's about the effect of them on the animal, the chicken, the pig, the cow. Exactly. It, it it causes selection of microbial, antimicrobial resistant bugs. Right. And then when you encounter them, so you touch a raw chicken when you're cooking it, you contaminate your hands, it gets into you. And then many years later, maybe you go for surgery and the antibiotics don't work because you're those bugs are antibiotic resistant. And the, remember on Twin, we did a we we did a paper uh, somewhere in the um, in Europe where they looked at patients in a hospital with antibiotic-resistant organisms, and they went out into the grocery stores around the hospital and found the same organisms in the meat being sold in those stores. So that's the problem. The constant feeding to the animals selects for antimicrobial resistance, and then we get those bugs. And, and then your, your point as well, going being shed is an issue. The other thing, they've done a lot of recent studies also about the actual benefits of giving antibiotics. To animals? And, yeah, and the growth rates of both groups were basically identical. This has changed over the years. So what happened, there, there are two uses for antibiotics in farm animals. One is to treat disease, and nobody is objecting to that. No. The other, which is much, much more common and accounts for vastly more of the global production of antibiotics right. than any other use, is feeding them as growth promoters. Right. And it, it was discovered uh, 50 years ago that if you fed low subtherapeutic levels of antibiotics to animals, they grew faster. Um, and this became the thing to do in agriculture. And uh, most of the antibiotics that have gone into human use have found their way subsequently into agriculture, mostly based on cost, mm -hmm. in this subclinical or subveterinary feeding regime that supposedly makes the animals grow faster. <laughs> it turns out that the growth promoting effects of this, however, have declined over the years. Yeah, yeah. That's, and that's there exactly are right. two explanations for that. One is that the breeds of animals have improved, and the other is that the animal husbandry has improved. So what may actually have been going on, and nobody ever really understood how this was working, how are we promoting growth with mm -hmm. these low levels of antibiotics, but what may have been happening is that we were treating um, subclinical levels of infection. And now that the husbandry practices have improved, those infections are not happening, and so the animals are healthier without the antibiotics. Right. But giving low doses is a great way to start drug resistance. Yes, it is. <laughs> and now, um, just to kind of wrap this up, at the end of 2017, the USDA finally, finally um, banned the use of antibiotics as growth promoters in farm animals. Here, here. All, oh. all farm animals. All of them. I believe that's across the board. 
All right. So this um, is uh, this study this, here saying there's there's no fix is all nonsense because it's banned anyway in the U.S. Um, right? It so, is now. Yeah. But some of them are also endocrine disruptors, which don't exactly match with what we were just saying as the story right. of of, of, of uh, hmm. record. What about other countries? They haven't followed us, right? Well, it depends on the country. Europe That's Europe true. did this uh, some time ago. Um, right. And I China. believe Japan did too. However, the major the major market now for antibiotics in agriculture and therefore antibiotics in general is in the developing world. Mm-hmm. And they are also drastically increasing their uh, the quantities of meat that they eat so that they can follow the American diet, which has turned out so well for us. <laughs> um, Alan, <laughs> and so come on, we sell all of our cigarettes abroad now too, but yeah, it's illegal exactly. here. It's, so, it's, the markets so now, are still there, right? Um, Crazy. You know, it's China maddening. and many of the countries in, in Africa Truly are. Maddening. You're seeing this huge uptake yeah, of antibiotics exactly and. Right. In the U.S., though, last question. In the U.S., is meat consumption continuing to increase? Yes. Yes. I think it's kind of leveled off. Hmm. Depends on the meat. I think red meat down. Yeah. Red I meat is down. Chicken is way up. Way up. Chicken has been doing extremely well. And how's right. fish doing? Uh, it depends on the fish. It depends on whether we fished it out. <laughs> farmed. No, well, farmed raised farm salmon raised and tilapia, those are on the rise. Yeah. Okay. They are. All right. Let's do some picks of the week. Here, here. Alan, what do you have for us? I have a pick that um, it would have been nice to have about 20 years ago, I guess. Um, <laughs> it's <laughs> right. But she probably wasn't doing this then. It's a, a site called Personal Finance for PhDs. And uh, this woman, Emily Roberts, is uh, has a PhD. And she has um, uh, some background in personal finance. I'm not sure she's got an about section that describes what she's uh, where she's coming from. Um but she provides advice for PhD students and postdocs to manage their finances, which are generally meager and therefore need particular management. Uh, and I, I am not endorsing anything in particular about what she says, except that going through this, I found that the advice was pretty much spot on and stuff that uh, I figured out over the years and would have been nice if somebody told me this further back. <laughs> Uh, so the the blog is all is all free advice about uh, very practical stuff about managing your finances and how to save and um, then she also does personal coaching and speaking. Mm-hmm. Cool. It, the topics seem really good to me too. I think it would have been good to know back then. <laughs> back in the day, yeah, yeah. It's, it's easy if you way. lived in South Bend, Indiana. There was nowhere to spend your money. Well, okay. <laughs> I, I went to graduate school in New York. Yes, awesome. I realize that. <laughs> but yeah, it's just it's very Too many basic. temptations. <laughs> it's very basic, you know how to how to approach budgeting, not just how yeah. to do it, but uh, how to. Um, you know, Were you married then, uh, Ellen? In grad school, no. Yeah, because I was, so I had an uh, extra income to rely on. Rich, what do you have well, for us? Sorry, uh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say just a couple of the topics: how to start investing just five dollars per month, don't make these investing mistakes, strategies for long-term saving. And just the topic names sound like really good things. Habits, yeah. developing good habits. That's right. Rich, what do you have? Right. This is a little late in the season because I, <laughs> you know, stored this uh, some time ago. But better late than never. Uh, this is a graphic I found. In, it's an animation, actually, that I found in the Washington Post uh, that shows every inch of snowfall that fell on the lower 48 this year. And so it's got a little calendar that clicks by and shows you the accumulation of snow in very various places. You're doing that to so, taunt us because you live in the I, south. Is that I what get, you're doing here, Rich? Well, <laughs> actually, I was looking down here because we actually had uh, I got a little bit. I know. snow in uh, – in, um, Austin, and I don't see it. I, I would expect a pixel. <laughs> yeah. Well, Rich, it's that light bluish gray. It's there. You can <laughs> run, Rich, but you can't hide. Florida is white, <laughs> completely white, nothing. That's yeah. Right. <laughs> well, parts of Texas are too. Yeah, right? there's, a, there's a quick little dusting that goes across the southeast. There you go. Yeah, and it's really impressive how it shows lake effect snow. Uh, yeah. You know, oh, for brother. Erie oh, right. and the western side of Michigan of and the upper creamed. peninsula. Yeah, that's right. And and also, um, this only lasts till March 26th. And yeah. in the Leelanau, yeah, which is in uh, northern Michigan, but not in the UP, if I'm correct. Um, uh, in Leelanau, 
last year in April, they had no snow. And this year, in the middle of April, when I saw this thing, they'd had 14 inches already just in April. So uh, yeah. uh, it was a snow there year. was more that came on top of this. Yep. this is you've, a even had, you've even had snow since March, haven't you, Kathy? Oh, yeah. We had snow in April. We, we had, had, we had we snow too. in April. Sure, we did. Absolutely. If you go down, you see the snow hole effect. Snow. Yeah, that, that's mm-hmm. interesting. <laughs> Which is interesting. Yeah. And then the parts of the country that got less snow than Washington, D.C., <laughs> including yeah, they had some, they really got cream this year. No, Russia they didn't. DC, DC got, only got eight inches. Yeah, well, usually they get 15, it says. They were here. kind of paralyzed for one of them, as I recall. Yeah, well, that one inch will paralyze DC. <laughs> oh, yeah. <gasps> Dixon, what do you have? Well, I have a follow up on my reference to uh, one um, strange rock, which is a series now on uh, television with uh, um, Will, I forget his first name. Um, He's the host. At any rate, he made a revelation uh, on the first uh, episode to show for many, many years, everybody thought that the rainforest uh, sort of fertilized itself with its falling leaves and made its own rain and all this other stuff. But it turns out a finding by NASA in 2015 clearly shows that most of the fertilizer for the rainforest in Brazil comes across the Atlantic Ocean from winds, the Chiracos that come off the Sahara Desert. And indeed, they get about 20 million, 20, yeah, 20 million tons. I, I didn't say that right here, but it's 20 million tons of dust actually reaches the Brazilian rainforest, and that's the basis for the fertilizer hmm. effects. But when it rains in the rainforest, all of that fertilizer washes out of the soil and down the Amazon and out into the ocean and fertilizes the ocean as Hmm. well. So there's a big link between these Chiracos and these dust storms and the fertilization of the ocean and the rainforest. And by the way, the reason why I point this out is because it's all changing. So this recent article shows how climate change is reducing the difference between the cold and the warm water, Hmm. and that reduces the intensity of the winds and therefore, it reduces the amount of soil that can be picked up from the Sahara Desert and put all over the place. And that's really the best, the, the, the biggest reason to be concerned about climate change is that it's going to alter the nutrition of basically everything everywhere. And it's going to change it. And we have to be somehow ready for that. Nice. So, Holistic view, right? Yeah. Kathy, yeah. what do you have? Uh, where am I? Sorry, I lost my place. Oh, yeah. Um, I picked optical illusions that fool artificial intelligence. (laughs) So this is a really cool link. If you just open it up, you see this famous rotating snake illusion. And the gist of the article is that uh, deep neural networks, which are uh, a a part of artificial intelligence, um, have been developed to do all kinds of uh, visual things. And they train them on natural scene videos of motion. And then when they test them on, say, a rotating propeller, the deep neural networks actually identify the rotating propeller. When they test it on this optical illusion, the deep neural networks also see the motion that tricks our eyes. It tricks the artificial intelligence. So I just thought that was really cool. Uh, that is bizarre. I mean, <laughs> the illusion itself is bizarre, and the notion yeah. that a computer would do it's, the same thing as cool. my it's brain very, very is cool. just yeah. mind-boggling. It's cool. Well, it, yep. Yeah. It's very neat. Art imitating art. <laughs> That's right. Well, my wow. pick has to do with today's snippet. It is a new book by Mark Palin. Mark Palin, who is a Mark Palin is a research leader at the Quadrum Institute in Norwich and a professor of microbial genomics at the University of East Anglia. He, the book is called The Last Days of Smallpox, Tragedy in Birmingham. Oh, yeah. Really interesting account of that. You know, we start, the last case in Somalia in 1977, then a year later there was a lab outbreak in Birmingham. I can't believe that. And a death, yeah, somehow. Well, actually. And then someone committed suicide right after that. Yeah, the lab head. That's right. <clears throat> so this is an interesting part. Anne is uh, Anne was one of the people that got infected. The first one. Anne works in a lab dedicated to research on a f- on farmer's lung, an allergic reaction to inhaled fungal spores. However, in the course of her research, she requires almost daily use of equipment across the corridor in the Pox lab, where she makes friends with a young research technician, Mister Bruno. 
On Wednesday, 28th February, Anne watches Mr. Bruno harvest eggs infected with a strain of variola major. So we are still vaccinating. So there's still no containment. Everybody's People are still working on this thing. Anne falls, falls ill on 11th March with fever, headache, backache, and vomiting. A couple days later, later visits a local GP, provide, prescribes a painkiller and an antibiotic, stays home for a few days. By Friday, 16th March, she is covered in small itchy spots, and the GP arranges for admission to hospital. The closest St. Mary's at Paddington is full, so she ends up in a satellite hospital. Her fading rash is labeled a drug reaction and her illness as a fever of unknown origin. Amazing. She is admitted to Ward 4, a medical ward for female patients. She starts off in the open part, but a day later, she and Mrs. Hurley were moved into a five-bedded unit set aside. That fateful Saturday, a house officer notices six pustules on Anne's chest and back. A short while later, the doctor on duty notes a pustule on her right hand, as well as smaller ones on chest and scalp. Curiously, with the appearance of the pustules, Anne started to feel a lot better, well enough to nag the doctors to let her go home. Mm. So that's the beginning of her infecting others. Rich, they really should have bad. had your drug. <laughs> As I was just going to say, <laughs> her, that drug would have helped a lot of people here. Now, the thing is, this is happening within a mile of the lab where they're working on pox virus, and it took them yeah. so long to pick it up. Yeah. Yeah. But it's quite a long book, actually. It covers all of this well-referenced, really nice. I highly recommend it. It's really good. Uh, the last days of smallpox. Yes, if they had and if you uh, And if you uh, are an Amazon Prime member, you can get it for free. Yeah, that's that's right. A lot of these Prime books are free. And uh, so, did you read this, uh, Rich? I have, but uh, when I saw your pick, I had heard, I think... Uh, uh, I saw Ed recently. I saw he was actually came to the FDA meeting because mm. remember he worked at BARDA right. while right. all this was going on. BARDA funded a lot of the right. yeah. uh, expensive research with SD246. So he, uh, he came, he attended the meeting uh, in the uh, audience as a, you know, as a part of the public at any rate. Uh, so I spent some time with him there and uh, I think he told me that he had read this. And I think it was he who told me that it was uh, uh, free, but I have not read it. His is written on the back of the book. In the summer of 1978, the smallpox virus creeps like a thief in the night from a lab in Birmingham to re-inhabit human flesh and blood. Come on. Ooh, a frantic zombie. effort follows to save a city and the world from disaster as a tragic victim suffers a terrifying fate and a persecuted protagonist is driven to mortifying despair. That's a little... Over the top. I don't Hyper think hyperbolic. Did yes, you say? it is over the top. <laughs> this is published by which press? Fox News Press. Yeah. <laughs> Where is the damn imprimatur here? Uh, come on, here we go. Nope, I, the, it's not the, on the front. On the spine. On the spine is just a picture of a woman with pox on her. There's nothing. It wasn't Self, published by anyone. Published? No, no, no. It can't be. <laughs> Why not? Copyright. Yeah, why not? Archipel, but it's so, it could be. Maybe he printed it himself. Yeah. Amazon sells yeah. a lot of self-published books. It's a nice, solid little book here. No, uh, apparently he self-published it. Huh? How about that? Mm -hmm. Maybe sold, by Amazon, sold by Amazon Digital Services, yeah. LLC. It is. How about that? It's really nice. Anyway, check it out. I like it a lot. That's TWIV493, microbe.tv slash TWIV. Questions and comments, TWIV at microbe.tv. If you'd like to contribute, microbe.tv slash contribute. Try a buck a month. You know, that's cheap for all the stuff you get. You can start with five dollars. Or try more. We're trying more, <laughs> but if you if you give more already, don't reduce it. No. Right? No, don't. No, of course not. And thanks to all of you who contribute. It helps us to move we around and travel and do things on the road and the quality of the sound you're listening to is directly proportional to the amount of funding we receive. <laughs> yeah. Dixon de Pommier can be found at, what do you want to quote this week? What website? Uh, let's see. Well, I still like Parasites on the Borders, of course. Dot Our Trichinella right. page. Org. We're working on that one. We're working on it. And we have a new one, which we'll feature on the next Next week. Week. Okay. Thank you, Dixon. Thank you. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. This is a lot of fun. Rich Condit is an emeritus professor at the University of Florida, Gainesville, currently residing in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. 
Alan Dove is at turbidplaque.com. He's also on Twitter as Alan Dove. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. And I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Thanks to ASM for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for his music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>